lot of esport events,、mm-hmm. and it just slowly started getting traction. Like before, there were K-pop stars, there was <laughs> esport stars. Okay, I'm, I'm being serious. Like.、Yeah. Welcome to the Buzz. I'm your host Valtteri Salamaki, and today I have my first guest, Bruce Kim, who is an undergraduate senior from University of California Riverside. He's a business student who will be working at Deloitte starting in the summer. So, Bruce, today what we have is we have four beers in our selection.、Uh, Where beers go from a nice casual Hangar 24 beer, and it punches it up from IPAs all the way to a nice peanut butter stout at the very end. So, we're going to start off first. With this Hangar 24,、um, it is from our local brewery here in Redlands. It's a nice, soft, you know, beer. But before we get started, what is Cheers in Korean?、Um, cheers in Korean is "kambae."、Uh, kambae. So you could say like the word "kam." Okay. And then "bae."、Um, kambae.、Yeah. Okay. Okay. Three, two, one. Kambae. Kambae. It's definitely a nice smooth beer. It's going to get a lot more intense when we go to the IPAs. But、mm-hmm. just to get the show started, so a little bit more about your background. So you are a business student here at UCR, but、uh, you're originally from Korea. So what was the process、uh, coming from Korea, and what has it been like in the United States?、Mm-hmm. So、um, I'm a first, gen- first generation immigrant from Korea.、Um, I came here when I was eight years old.、Mm-hmm. Um, the change is just incredible, I think, because. Um, the way Korea's like hierarchy is structured,、mm-hmm. the way the school is structured, the way the social custom is, everything has been、um, quite different from Amer- from Western culture.、Yep. And I think overall, it has just made me a more outgoing person.、Um, also, really created a personality and really a goal、um, oriented mindset. Because unlike Korea, where you have to really work up in a、um, hierarchy and you have to. Just You're always going to be under someone, but at the same time, you have to put in your work and hours to go up. America is more of like if you really want something, you have to go out and get it yourself,、mm-hmm. figure out the ways, and really strive and work for it. You know? Yeah, definitely. No, I, I definitely see that that culture shift.、Um, same thing with me from from Finland. Different kind of、uh, background, you know, different kind of culture, and getting used to that immersion of U.S. culture is it's it is kind of new.、Uh, but kind of going into that thought process, so. That transition with culture change, how has that kind of impacted your time here at UCR? Because you are a leader on campus. I know you are an ambassador,、uh, and you put a lot of time on campus. So, what has that culture change kind of impacted your mindset? I really didn't do well in high school. I、uh, kind of took a backseat. I played a lot of sports, and I kind of hung out with a lot of my friends.、Yep. But when I came to UCR, I really wanted to come out with a job guaranteed. I really wanted to come out knowing that I. Did my four years at the best level that I could have done it,、mm-hmm. and so when I was going in and throughout the whole time I was here, I was always striving to see、uh, what is next for my step. Like,、yeah. um, to get a job, like at first year, like do I need to? How well do I need to network?、Mm-hmm. How well do I need to talk to people and、um, figure out how well do I need to study? And like taking it step by step, I think、uh, really just kind of. It kind of just led to like a step, really led to another step, and it really became a stepping stone、mm-hmm. to、um, where I'm at right now. And I, I know definitely like during your time in undergrad, you definitely put in the work as you step, like stepping stones all the way up. And I, I know you did an internship at Amazon.、Um, so how was it working for one of the largest companies in the world? Amazon is really great. I mean, their work, their、um, work culture is really rough, but at the same time, it's very rewarding.、Okay. Um, Amazon is a place where,、um, if you're a manager, they really promote you to really tackle task on your own and figure out how to do it. Everyone is willing to help you out. However,、um, you have to make the initiative. And a place like that was really great for me because I was so used to finding out ways by myself on what to do and how to do it, and having. Uh, resources around me that I can utilize was the perfect place for me to grow, and I think my time at Amazon really propelled me into getting an offer at Deloitte. Okay, and、uh, what do you personally think about、uh, Amazon's announcement of the one-day Prime shipping? Do you think that's going to change、uh, a lot with the fulfillment centers because、yeah. they are, you know, really,、yeah. really fast-paced already? So, what do you think the one-day shipping is going to do for that? I think it's going to change a lot. I mean, I think、um, they're going to they're going to try to push out more of Prime now, and they really want to push out the instant、um, delivery. And、mm-hmm. I think it's going to Really change how supply chain and logistics is done in America because、um, the fulfillment centers are some of them are、um, automata,、um, automatized、mm-hmm. with Roombas and things of that nature.、Yeah. So like having that,、um, I think it's going to really create another level of scale that we haven't seen before. Okay, and do you think、uh, their major competitors like Target and Walmart do you, do you think that 
they still have that competitive advantage because they have the you know the actual infrastructure of retail stores like a, you can literally same day you can go pick it up mm -hmm. compared to amazon is still you know distribution based and it comes to your door it has a convenience factor but what walmart and target like to you know shit on uh, Amazon for is the, the cost of Prime because Walmart yeah. and Target, they don't have a cost. You they can just go get it. You can still get two day shipping, yeah. um, but there's no membership fee. So do you think that these competitors still have a shot in the you know long long term? Yeah, I think um, you can, I think you can never really replace retail stores. I think no matter how um, advanced we get, I think you can never change the uh, experience of going to a store and actually wearing the clothes, actually seeing the how big the machine is or mm. like getting all that specifications. And then, um, so in my opinion, I think that Amazon will um, be even a bigger force in the logistics of things. However, um, Walmart and Target will still be around. Um, with that being said though, I think it all just depends on how our culture shifts and um, whether or not we value those things anymore. Because I think you can see like Toys R Us closed down you rarely see Kmart or Sears or those kind of other um, big retail stores anymore. Mm -hmm. So depending on how we as um, consumers see whether or not like we value going to a store yep. and having that experience versus the ease of buying it online. I mean, I think just seeing that trend, we'll see um, whether or not Amazon will take over or not. Yeah, dude, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think it's very fascinating to kind of really see what is going on with um, Amazon's acquisitions because they are buying yeah. out all their small competitors. They are. Uh, it's a very aggressive strategy, mm -hmm. but it does work for the long term because they are building out their own infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if you heard about the rumor that they were actually debating about purchasing Target, uh, acqu acquiring Target. Um, what do you think would happen if they were able to acquire a Target, which is a long fetch thing because it is too high value. I don't think Amazon can afford it mm -hmm. currently, but do you think that would change the game and they would beat out Walmart right from there? What I think is um, rather than acquiring Target, I think they should acquire Costco. Okay. Just because I think Costco is already having, they already have a warehouse-like um, setting. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Costco already has membership. So it'll be easier to transition <laughs> Prime membership combined with Costco membership and having that. The reason that I don't see Amazon buying out Target is because Target already competes with Walmart. Yep. So if Amazon buys a Target, it just becomes an Amazon versus a Walmart type of thing. However, mm -hmm. if Amazon um, leaves Target within within the competition, it's gonna be a three-way fight all the way through. Mm -hmm. And I think having that is better for Amazon to, um, well, they don't need to focus on resources on That's retail. true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I think that'll negate the fact that there's price war competition when there's only two parties involved mm -hmm. and all that. So I definitely agree with that. So going into the next beer, uh, we have a uh, Stone IPA. Uh, this is an Imperial IPA, it's called Revengeful Spirit. So this beer is uh, from San Diego. It's an Escondido, it's a brewery. I go here quite often. This one is uh, a little bit stronger. So it's a 8.1% beer. We were jumping out from the 5% to the 8%. <laughs> but uh, to cheers to that, man. Cheers. How's it taste? Nice. That's a little kick to it, yeah. yeah so nice. this one has, uh, it has some, um, Pineapple, and then also has a mandarin in it, so it has that you know aftertaste of citrus, yeah, but it has to pack the punch, tones, yeah, yeah, with the IPA. Definitely, it's actually like a pleasant surprise. Yeah, no, it's a definitely a good beer, and it's gonna get stronger from here. But uh, <laughs> going to kind of uh, continuing the topic of your experience from Amazon. So how does that kind of transcend now into your senior year of college? Now that you've had an experience with a large company and you're preparing yourself for Deloitte, so how does that kind of change your mindset going into the last couple years of your uh, college? you know, experience mm -hmm. uh, to prepare yourself for the real world. I mean, no matter what role you get as an Amazon intern, it could be whether or not you work at as, work as an area manager intern or as a loss prevention intern or even like a marketing intern or finance. It is very competitive within and they really promote inner growth and they really push everything on you and they really push you to a very high expectation. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I, I think it kind of um, prepared me to really my senior year um, push myself out there and in a way in the case of um, Deloitte mm -hmm. I think once I do start it's gonna push me to really make the network make mm -hmm. the connections and really um, Not be afraid to ask questions because at Amazon asking a question was a great thing yep. like, If you didn't have questions, that's a bad thing on you and kind of going off of that uh, My main philosophy when it comes to college education is I believe that college education itself It's not necessarily that much about the, the learning process that you learn in classrooms But it's more about the opportunity to network in a college campus and uh, your own self-growth. So during your time in undergrad, what would you kind of recommend to undergrad students that they put their emphasis and their time into in undergrad? Uh, because a lot of people do put so much emphasis into studying. It's, it's great to get good grades, but what do you think that students primarily 
As a successful student as yourself and a leader on campus, what should students be doing? Um, I recommend that students really put a focus on networking and getting an internship because I think that um, parents and everyone else really tells you get an internship, get an internship. Mm -hmm. However, it's not as easy as it looks, especially if you just have grades. You're not gonna. You're likely not to get an internship. You need to have leadership experiences on campus through various organizations, or you need to um, really network. And that's what I recommend the most is to really network and uh, meet the people mm -hmm. that have been. I mean, they have worked in the field, like professors. Um, before I worked at Amazon, um, I actually got an internship with the city of Riverside at the. Um, Riverside Transportation Department. Okay. And that was all because of a professor that I knew. Mm -hmm. um, he walked by and because I worked at the business office, he was actually telling me like, hey, you know, Bruce, I know you've been struggling finding internships. I know someone that works at this department who's actually hiring some interns right now. Okay. And um, straight there, uh, we just, I went to that um, interview and yep. it wasn't even an interview. She kind of just told me what my job duties were, mm -hmm. told me how much I was getting paid and um, <laughs> just gave me the job on the spot. Mm -hmm. So like with that being considered, all that happened because I was networking and I was putting myself out mm -hmm. there, talking with professors, going after um, during the office hours and really just making a connection with them. Because um, and it's another thing about networking, I think that people don't understand completely is that it's not just about giving someone your LinkedIn and being like, hey, you know, can I like get an internship at your company exactly, or something yeah. like that? It's about building a connection and actually getting the other person to care about your yep. growth because once that connection happens, they'll fight for you, for you to succeed. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, it's kind of just to tag on to that. I, I do see that quite often as people always talk about networking, mm -hmm. but their focus is what can they get from somebody? And uh, my own yeah. personal philosophy is you have to give value before you get value. Mm -hmm. You can never go to somebody and just ask for something. You have to have a reason. So that's definitely a good approach to it. Um, and now kind of going, uh, continuing to that, um, now you're about to start, you know, at Deloitte. So what are you really looking forward to having uh, a position as a, a BTA at Deloitte? Um, what kind of experiences are you really looking forward to? For all those um, that don't know what BTA is, um, it's business tech analyst at a Deloitte. Yep. Um, what I really am looking forward to is just gaining any and all types of experience, whether it be um, working in tech or working as a consultant or um, as an analyst or um, experiencing I guess in a way a new way of networking mm -hmm. and like having a such a wide range network internationally yeah. I think just any opportunities that I see I'm just I want to just take full advantage of it mm -hmm. and I think that's what I'm really looking forward to is because it's because I'm um, a student a bu any business student I think getting a job at the big four um, is such a big opportunity that yeah. no matter I mean what type of um, situation that it presents itself you really need to be really willing to take forward in it and I'm, I'm just looking forward to doing that. Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. Let's finish up that next beer. And let's get into the nice Hop Stupid. So this is a Lagunitas beer. Lagunitas is from Petaluma, California, so Northern California. So this one's called Hop Stupid. The name kind of defines itself. Um, it is a 8% beer as well. Um, mm -hmm. It is not an IPA, it is still an ale, mm -hmm. uh, but it is called Hop Stupid, so uh, like cheers to that. Come back, come back. It's awesome. going up and up. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this one's the last strong beer we're going to have. The, mm -hmm. the dessert beer is at the very end. Um, but kind of going into the beer selection, this is definitely my favorite beer just because it has that strength of the beer itself, you know? Yeah. Um, without all that fruity flavor. I personally only like the fruity flavor and the hanger as well. Um, on hot days, I mean, it is a hot day. We're in Riverside currently. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this beer itself is something that, you know, mm -hmm. I very much enjoy. It's very clean. Yeah. Very clean. I'm glad you like it. Uh, but kind of going on, um, so we kind of understand now your background, what you are doing for professional career. Now let's go into kind of um, what is your passion? So I know that you personally love video games um, and you've kind of created a kind of entrepreneurial spirit behind it. And uh, can you explain a little bit behind that? The past, um, the past year and in 2018, I went to BlizzCon, and BlizzCon is a convention made for um, Blizzard Entertainment. Uh, it's a video game publisher. Yep. Overall arcing uh, publisher is Blizzard Activision. Um, at, well, Activision Blizzard. Um, wow, the beer's getting to me. There but you um, <laughs> that being said, um, BlizzCon was a really interesting experience because I'd never been to a convention before, and it was such a awesome thing because. Like when you're growing up, um, you don't really think of like video games as a popular type of um, thing, you know? Yeah. Like I wrestled, you played football, mm -hmm. like 
sports were like the thing that everyone wanted to like talk yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. And then like with that being in mind, I never been to a place where there's so many, um, like I think it was around 30,000 or 20,000 people yep. that were all um, there because they just loved the video game, mm -hmm. you know, um, whatever it be. And then it wasn't even like um, hundreds of video games. It was just like, uh, I think five mm -hmm. Blizzard had. Um, with that being said, like just being in that environment really um, showed me like what people are passionate about, yeah. same as me. What I found out was that people buy a lot of collectibles. Mm -hmm. And in a way that's interesting because um, a lot of these um, people that attend these events are, um, whether they be into tech or other um, professions, they still pur purchase very expensive collectibles because it, lot, I mean, it is very similar to the collectibles that they have in their characters in mm -hmm. the game. So with that reason, um, I just saw a lot of passionate things about them. So I wanted to get into that field because I found, well, my own, myself really enjoying that type of um, collectibles. And I saw that there's a need for it. So why not create a demand I mean, mm -hmm. and supply? Yeah. Awesome. So pretty much kind of going into that, I know you kind of like to sell like the action figures and all that you buy and uh, supply. So why do you think that you're able to kind of make such a profitability off of just these action figures? Is it because it's such a niche product or is it because it's so upcoming or what, why do you believe that like you can make so much profit off of just kind of flipping action figures? Yeah. Um, so I buy a lot of um, convention exclusives, um, whether I go to the conventions or I have someone go to them or I just buy them off of other retailers online. But um, the reason that there's so much um, high retail value on these is because that these peop um, these individuals that buy these products have grown up with this um, product for years. Mm -hmm. For example, like StarCraft, they recently celebrated their, I believe, um, 20th anniversary. Like that game has been around pretty for much really long as time. I've been alive. Yeah. And with that being said, it's just there's so much history behind it and there's so much love that we grew up playing these video games mm -hmm. with our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and our friends that whenever there's something that whenever something comes out that reminiscence about the good times, we buy it because it's just yeah. something that we cherish. Yeah. You know, and then um, with that being said, so many people buy these type of convention exclusive because they're so rare. It's like the business concept of um, rarity, you know, mm -hmm. um, as you could put a number to something and the price just goes sky skyrockets, yeah. you know. Uh, with that being said, um, that's why I just got into it because I collect them for myself. Mm -hmm. and while I'm collecting them, um, I like to perhaps, you know, make a profit on some things. Definitely. You know? So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that that's awesome because it's definitely a passion of yours and mm -hmm. turn that into revenue, definitely a businessman of that way. Mm -hmm. um, kind of going off of uh, talking about Blizzard, what is your favorite Blizzard game? Oh man, StarCraft. StarCraft by far? Yeah, grew up, grew up with that. Um, I like Overwatch, I like World of Warcraft, I like all that, but um, I still remember um, before I came to America, the last time my family got together, like our whole extended family, yeah. was um, we went fishing, and then um, afterwards, um, all of my older um, cousins took me out to uh, PC, Bang, okay. PC Bang, which is like uh, basically a, a room just filled with computers. and. Um, yeah, we just play StarCraft until okay. like um, night till dawn. Wow, Our okay. parents got angry, but um, it was just like the last really touching moment that I had with them. And um, and especially in South Korea, like StarCraft is kind of like a cult there. So mm. I mean, that being said, like it's kind of ingrained in me. And actually, how, how do you feel about uh, how South Korea approaches uh, esports? Because they're very serious about it. The, the yeah. entire the South Korean government supports their esports yeah. team. So, what is the culture behind esports in South Korea? Because when we get to last year, we're going to go into esports platforms. But before that, I kind of want to understand your understanding of esports in South Korea. I think esports in South Korea, oh man, to be honest, even I don't really know how why why or how big it got yeah but i know that esports in korea began with starcraft mm -hmm. and i think as it gained traction back in the brood war days or starcraft original um it really showed just how big the fan base was because um like uh, going back to what we talked about the korean culture and like the eastern culture versus the western culture it's very rooted in um going to school and afterwards we have things called after schools yeah and we would go to those until like say 8 p.m., 9 p.m. or very late at night. Mm -hmm. And then we would go home or we would go spend our time at PC Bang mm -hmm. and we would play with our friends and then we would go home and things like that. So as that was ingrained in our culture, it became more evident because everyone was playing StarCraft yep. that it became a sport out of it. Okay. And once that became a sport, um, before Activision Blizzard um, merged together, mm -hmm. Blizzard started doing a lot of esport events mm -hmm. and it just slowly started getting traction like before there were K-pop stars, 
there was <laughs> esports stars. Okay. I'm, I'm being serious. Like, yeah. there's literally like videos and stories of people um, filling buses with gifts for yeah. these um, esports pros. Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. Yeah. All right, so finish up that beer, and we're getting yeah. to the last beer, which is peanut butter stout. Mm -hmm. um, this also is a San Diego beer. Uh, it's made in Vista, California. Um, this one is by itself a dessert beer. You always want to drink this one last. You don't want to drink it, you know, early because after this one, you have the nice sugary taste in your mouth and this is the one you want to end on. It's a nice 5% beer. Cheers to that. Cheers. What's a cheers and a finish? Keep peace. Keep peace. So you can taste how it's definitely a dessert beer, right? Wow, that is so sweet. Yeah, it, it, so tastes, sweet. it tastes like coffee. It's yeah. literally, you know, it has a nice sugar, you have a peanut butter, the aftertaste, but yeah. it tastes like coffee. It tastes like coffee. Yeah. I, mean, I could taste a little bit of peanut butter, but yeah. Yeah, it's the aftertaste. But um, mm -hmm. going off of esports, so what do you think the future of esports really looks like? Because esports itself is growing so much traction in the market. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you just saw it, but there was a press release that was just released that Comcast bought out an entire stadium in Philadelphia to provide a esports platform. Mm, so for yeah. esports tournaments, for esports viewing. Um, so even if Comcast, these top, you know, billion dollar companies are now getting involved in esports, so what do you what do you think is gonna happen with it? I think the sky's the limit on this because mm. I think esports such a new genre of sports. Like, yep. like you can't really imagine like um, like you can't even tell me like when um, NFL became a thing and mm -hmm. like how they started investing and how the investors got into it, you know, mm -hmm. but what Whatever they spent to get into the NFL and create their own teams were probably abysmal like in the um, Price comparison to what they're probably worth now. Yeah, you know? so that's why all these big companies and even um, Figures such as I'm not sure if you guys know like the weekend mm -hmm. Invested in I think Overwatch League. Yep, like it's insane, like all these, um, whether it be artists or um, previous NBA players mm -hmm. or even organizations themselves are investing because it's such a, like a possibility of something greater, yeah. you know? And it could turn into something great. So because of that, there's so much chance of um, possible new frontier that, mm -hmm. that everyone's just rushing to it like a gold mine. Yeah, no, it's crazy to me because you see these 14 year olds that are professional esports players and they're making $400,000 yeah, yeah, a year. Yeah, I'm a little jealous. Yeah, yeah I know. A, I'm, I'm kind of mad my parents money, put yeah. me into sports. I wish I was playing esports, you know? <laughs> but at, at the same time, like, I, I, even countries are getting involved. Like I, I brought up South Korea, uh, Finland mm -hmm. itself, like we have a CSGO training facility for Top yeah, you guys are really good at um, yeah games. Yeah, like so every every country is now getting involved in it. Governments are getting involved into it, and um, companies are getting involved in it. But what do you think when it comes to actually developing these platforms? Do you think that esports itself is as viable as a professional sport right now? Do you think in the next couple, like let's say ten years from now, mm -hmm. you the same amount of viewership in American football and the NFL is going to be the same as esports? Yeah, um, actually, I believe that because I think. As younger generations grow up with technology, mm -hmm. they're going to be exposed to more of um, just video games in general on their phones. Yep. And with that being said, I think um, as more um, people grow up relating to technology, mm -hmm. they're going to be more easily accessible to other things. And I think esports is in the center of that technology. Um, with that being said, I just think that um, the growth that esports has internationally, because knowing how a game works, you don't only need to translate in other language. That's why soccer, you know, um, even though it may not be popular in America, it's popular in every international yeah, that's country. That's why it's called football there and yeah. here it's soccer, you know. Because <laughs> like the rules are pretty simple. And yeah. then once like you play a video game, you probably know the rules. Mm -hmm. That's why I think that as we go um, forward in 10 years, we're going to probably see eSport being a more, to be honest, a bigger cornerstone than probably football or other, com I mean, other um, sports. Mm -hmm. It might not be big as NFL or NBA or even um, like other sports like that, but I definitely think that it'll be up there with them as well. Yeah, no, I definitely do see that in the future. I do see the trend if you look at the growth of esports in general. I mean, nowadays tournaments, I think the top one is Dota. I think this is a $10 million top prize or yeah. something like that. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. You think about it, you, you play in a tournament and the winner gets a million dollars per person on the team. Yeah. Even NFL players, they don't get that much from winning the Super yeah. Bowl. So. It is, it is very interesting. Um, do you personally want to get involved with esports after, like later down the yeah, career path? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, I mean, again, I think it has to do with like the passion that you grew up with. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think, um, I think the number one rule or one of the bigger rules of investing is invest in something that you know, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think I love 
esports in general. I love that's what I grew up with. So if I do get the chance, I would love to invest in a team or uh, create a team myself mm -hmm. and then see just where it goes. Because to be honest, like that's what I'm passionate about, you know? So even if I lose money on the short run or even the long run, as long as I can continue to support what I re am really passionate about, I think I'm satisfied. That, that's awesome. That's awesome to hear. That Those are the main questions I had for you today. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on to The Buzz and talking about your background, your future goals. And just to kind of close it out, do you have any final advice for, you know, college students, even people in their professional career? What should they kind of, you know, do or what should they learn from your experiences that, you know, speed track their life? One thing to know is that um, don't really chase after, I mean, chase after success, but don't chase after the money aspect of things. Um, I really value money a lot because I came up from a very, um, not a very well-off family mm -hmm. and money was always an issue in our um, family times. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, I think money is just a tool for you to be um, happy. I mean, for you to really come, um, just be well off in a certain situation mm -hmm. because I think it can make you happy in a way like um, your first date or your first graduation from high school, things like that. Like those are happinesses that you really can't buy with money. However, uh, money can pay bills and things of that nature. So I think that when people come into college, they have like an expectation like, oh, my parents want me to be an accountant mm -hmm. or like my parents want me to do this or that because it's safe or it has the um, content, like I could just make money off of it. Yeah. Don't, I mean, you can go with that, but just know that money isn't gonna get you everything that you want in life. Mm -hmm. And down the road, it's just, money is just money like if you're just if you um, end up your career with just having a, a big salary it's not gonna you don't get that satisfaction you know? yeah you don't get that like, satisfaction. there's no motivation and keep going if it's just all you do is make money but i'm um, just having that passion behind it i think that's what's really important and then also just realizing where you come from all right man yeah. cheers to that let's finish this off cheers thank you guys for watching the buzz i hope you guys enjoyed the video if you guys enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe to get more free logic. Also, please follow us on our social media platforms linked below. See you guys next time. Cheers.